Today we're going to talk about moldings. I feel like I could talk about moldings forever. It is one of the lost arts of building and is one of the things I care passionately about. series hosted by Brent Hall new house old soul sponsored by stellar floors and the Unico system We have a reputation in Fort Worth that if you want a traditional house, you know, with traditional moldings, we're kind of the guys because I know so much about moldings and I think they are so valuable. The history of moldings, right? When did we start using moldings? Well, we've always used moldings. We've, you know, going back even to very simple houses in the early 1700s, they were using moldings because they separate where a door jam comes together with the casing or the plaster. There needs to be naturally a molding that closes off that connection and so moldings have always been used. The other thing about moldings is that they are based on a classical system traditionally. That means that classical system of the pedestal, column, entablature, you know, cornice, all of those different parts and pieces define, okay, at least historically, what size your moldings were, you know, what they looked like, where they went. And if you've watched my videos for long, you know, one of my pet peeves is the chair rail and putting it at 36 inches. Unless your ceilings are 15 feet or taller, your chair rail does not belong at three feet. So if you take anything away from this video, know that chair rails don't belong at three feet. I say that because it's based on the classical system. Go watch my videos on that and, and go look at that because it's very informative of size of door casing, the height, the pedestal, height, the base. All of those things were determined in that classical system. And it was a practice that was carried on into World War II, right? It's only after as modernism creeps into building styles and things that we have, you know, a clamshell molding. There is no clamshell molding, you know, before 1950. This is a modern solution for a molding. It is a door casing that is meant to disappear in many respects if you look at the theory of moldings and how moldings are supposed to work. So moldings have changed a great deal. I mean, if you just look at some of the ways we used to trim out things going going back into the 1920s with a casing, an apron, a sill and an apron, and just the number of moldings that used to go into how we would trim out a window. Or if you were looking at a door header or even a mantle that we would build up moldings like this with your door casing, a pulvinated frieze, and then your bed mold, Corona and Cymation, all over a door header, beautifully done. This is the way we used to build. And so we've kind of lost that art of building. But look even at a MDF base that you can get at the big box stores versus a three quarter inch base that was standard, right? Before 1940, before World War II, before moldings began to change. And you know, if the purpose of moldings is to communicate strength, communicate placement, communicate hierarchy, different things like that. It's very difficult to do it with this molding because these lines are so small. By the time I, I caulk this joint, I've lost that sharp line. I've lost that detail. And after a couple times of painting this thing, it just becomes a muddy mess. So small moldings are one of those last arts. You look at door casings as well. Here's two more winter door casings. These things that are just so small, I mean about two inches wide by you know, three eighths inch tall. And then you look at an historic door casing <laughs> and look at it, you know, it's wider than two of them put together. And certainly it's thicker than, you know, two of them put together, right? They three or four of them to reach this dimension and this size. But this a door casing around a window or around a door punctuates an opening. Now that is a classical concept and a classical way of thinking about how moldings are supposed to work that you punctuate an opening just like there's a language to classical architecture there's even punctuation a finishing and an end if you look at the historic pattern books there was a relationship between the size of the opening and the size of your door casing those things were part of the how you built and those things have been lost so if you want a new house with an old soul there's nothing that's going to communicate that 
old soul like good moldings. So that, if nothing else from this whole series, moldings matter and size matters, and it really can make a huge difference in how your new house feels and looks. So the classical system, if you're not familiar with it, you can go to my YouTube page. I've got videos up there of the classical system was a way of building, okay? If you've ever heard of the five orders of architecture or an order of architecture was a proportioning system, okay? It was a, a way of building. There was the Tuscan order, very thick and strong, very feminine, Ionic and Corinthian orders were based on a female body, but it's all based on a human scale, okay? So the Tuscan order is based on a one to seven relationship. Where'd that come from? Well, my foot is 11 inches long. I'm 76 inches tall, right? If I was 77, that'd be a one to seven relationship. No wonder that's where they got it. They actually looked at the human body. I use moldings on our projects to communicate a story. I use moldings to establish hierarchy. You go into the main room of a house, an important room, the moldings are very elevated, okay? You go into a third floor, second floor bedroom, right? The moldings are not elevated in that space. Even moldings between the first floor and the second floor change. And so if you're building and thinking about a molding package for your house, you're not putting a eight inch space downstairs and an eight inch space upstairs. In my mind, you're doing an eight inch space downstairs and a five or six inch space upstairs, right? You are stepping down in size, typically in ceiling heights are changing as well as you go to a second floor. You're going into a private space. It's not a public space. And so it's not as important to, to elevate those, those rooms. One great example to study historic precedent is to go to Winter Tour. Winter Tour is this magical place, H.F. DuPont, you know, home where he began to collect American antiques in the 1920s. And not only would he collect antiques, he would actually collect the rooms they were held in. And so if he had a Philadelphia high boy, he found a parlor from Philadelphia that was being torn down and bought the room and installed it into his house and then installed all the furniture there so it would be in a period appropriate setting. There was 175 rooms at Winter Tour dating from 1640 to 1860. It's an amazing place where you will see all kinds of precedent, all kinds of different rooms and different houses from Georgian and federal to Greek revival. You just see this wide swath from very rustic taverns to very high style Philadelphia townhouses. And so it's an amazing place that tells you a lot about historic architecture, historic precedent, and you know, going and measuring those moldings. Want to learn about how things were done historically? Go to Winter Tour. I did a video recently on crown moldings and sometime during the McMansion era, crown moldings became the fine art of moldings. And so I find it to be one of the great sins of moldings, right? Where you see crown, 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 crown built up as if four pieces of crown are gonna make it look richer or make it look better instead of adhering to those classical proportions and classical details. So just using more, okay, is not a way to make your houses better. Following historic precedent, following a historic narrative, finding someone who really understands what molding should look like and how they should go together in order to get something that's beautiful and long lasting. So moldings narrate, moldings communicate, moldings are a language. And let me show you how that works. I've got three moldings right here. I've got a federal casing, a Georgian casing, and a Greek revival casing, okay? Now, how do I know, okay? Well, within each period of time, there was a story that caused this molding to look like this, okay? This back band with this bulbous, you know, quarter round there is, is Georgian, okay? Why is it Georgian? Well, first of all, it's based on a circle. And second of all, during the Georgian period, a lot of the interior moldings were run like exterior moldings and they end up being big and strong. And because this kicks out, it projects, right? And, and it comes into the room and it reads as much heavier and stronger. By contrast, this molding has been cut away. We see a cutaway there, we see a cutaway there. Because it's been diminished, because it's been cut away, it's softer, it's not as bold, it's not as in your face. And then these little cuts, okay, these little details right here, communicate shadow lines. And so there are shadow lines in this molding that are soft and they break up this large space into things that we can read. And remember, each different period was looking to the past. The Georgian period was looking to Italy and Rome. The federal period had discovered the things in Pompeii and Herculaneum. And so they were much daintier and lighter. And then the Greek revival, obviously studying the Greek culture and seeing the shapes and the details that were used in the original Greek buildings. And they changed their shape 
shapes again. So each one of these is driven by an historical period. Each one is driven by an historical story, and each one communicates differently. The, the whole idea of the Greek Revival period was to mimic Greek temples, to mimic Greek design and stonework in particular. So we have very stone-like moldings in the Greek Revival period because that's the way they were building them back then. So I want to go talk to Richard, Finnish Carpentry TV. Some of you follow him. He's a master trim carpenter, okay? I think he would say that learning how things were done in the past elevated his game, not only the type of things he does, but his craftsmanship as well. So let's go talk to him. You've done a lot of work for us now, and you were doing that trim for homeowners doing a lot of MDF. Now you're doing trim, especially at that stop house. You did a great job in that room, putting up real moldings. Yeah. Tell us, what's the difference? You know, what are you finding? What are you learning? What's going on? Well, the thing I think that is the most interesting is I always come back to that first building in Bruise when I actually met you. And in your showroom here, right off the studio that we're standing in, you have all these moldings, all these intricate things, all these cornice crown buildups build yeah. that are just so, something I've never seen before. So for me, seeing that, I saw an opportunity that like really just sparked like a childlike emotion in me to be like, whoa, there's a whole nother world out there that I have never even seen before, yeah. you know, because I spend a lot of my times in these kind of monotonous production built homes, you know, and those guys that build those houses, the, the architect, they're missing out on opportunities that they could be, you know, getting into some of this more detailed stuff. And that, you know, that's the opportunity I keep talking about. There's a personality to the moldings, there's a story, there's a narrative that's being told. You know, just not only could the quantity of moldings increase, you know, especially based on historic precedent, but the size of the individual moldings can increase and the beauty can increase as well. Those moldings are not just put there so we spent more money. They're there to communicate a story. They're there to, you know, communicate hierarchy and punctuate a door opening and, you know, do stuff that matters. Yeah, I remember talking to you one time early on when we first met, you were like, well, a lot of these lumber yard moldings, they're just like bumps and bruises on yeah. the board. And I'm like, yeah, that's stuff I'm putting in. <laughs> <laughs> and then I get to into the Staub house and I get to install historically period correct moldings, stuff that was Basically, you guys took down what was there because you remodeled this thing. Yeah, we're copying the past. You took down the profile that was there, opened up some walls, so therefore, whole millwork had to remake these moldings. They made them all in poplar. They're crisp, they're clean, they're definitive, and we had the glorious opportunity to put them up. So if you want to learn more, want to see him actually installing these moldings and doing that stuff, Follow him on Finnish Carpenter TV, he's on YouTube, easy to find. But he and I are working a lot together and building beautiful things together. Now I'm gonna take you over to a house we did a few years ago, Colonial Revival House, Georgian style house, designed after a house in South Carolina, which is completely awesome. So let's go check it out. talking about you know trim you're talking about architectural details you're talking about things that tell a story you know one of the things that we did in this Georgian revival house is we wanted to have Georgian moldings we wanted to have the proper moldings the proper scale of moldings now at the same time we were trying to balance it with that Georgian moldings can be really heavy and strong and so we've actually got the scale of a Georgian molding, but kind of used a federal <laughs> semblance of or personality. So basically Georgian moldings are thick and bulbous, right? They're strong, they're projected, okay? Federal moldings are oftentimes cut away, so they're, so they're relieved, right? And so you'll see this relief in this molding that we've got here, but we also are off the wall, you know, two and a half, three inches, okay? And so if you look at that cannon, right, the, the, the classical things from the pattern book catalogs from the 1750s, 1760s, moldings were huge, right? This is only probably a four and a half, five inch molding. Sometimes those moldings were six and eight inches wide. We didn't do that, we wanted to dial it around, but 
we have communicated, and especially if you come into here, we've communicated this story of this mass and boldness, but done it with a slight twist because typically if these were Georgian panels, they'd be raised panels, but these are flat panels. And so they're not as projected and strong. And so we, we have, you know, a molding, we notice from our wainscot, it's about, you know, 30, 31 inches. Notice that it ties into the chair rail. There are some classical architectural tricks or methods that we can use to highlight and build things up. Notice over the, the doorways, we have cross headed corners, right? And so that's another, you know, classical detail that kind of elevates this room. So we wanted to elevate this space. We've got a wainscot that goes around. And of course, everything ties back into this chair rail, the built-in cabinet pieces and native side and of course this mantle so a beautiful room made more beautiful because we've got moldings that communicate the story of the house moldings that contribute and build on architecturally what's already taking place So there's an elevation and a hierarchy we're trying to do here. The fact that we have a pedestal that we built out this wainscot and a pilaster on top of it, it goes across and beams this ceiling, right? This space has now been broken into three spaces. We got small, small, and then big in the middle. That invites you from that front door all the way out to the back of the house over the pool. And then back here, we've got a Georgian room, also told in a different manner. This is not an attempt to be historically pure, right? This is an attempt to play with and be inspired by the past. Historically, what you had on these houses is you had, in a Georgian room, you had full panel rooms, right? We didn't have a full panel room in this house and we decided to make this our full paneled room. And so we've got kind of this, this funny structure of this cornice above with that fretwork dental. We've got this idea of the triglyphs coming through here. And then these large panels that are, you know, flat panels, not raised panels, as I said, but we've got a full paneled room in this house. It's very appropriate to this architecture tipping our hand to our love for classical details. But again, notice the scale of size of the moldings. Notice that these panels, okay, are not just done with cabinet shop panel, but that panel sticks out from the wall, what, an inch and a quarter, right? It's really big and strong so that it communicates that these walls and these panels are much heavier and stronger than they should be. All I'm doing, guys, is I'm taking moldings and I'm stretching their sizes. I'm playing with the scale and proportion of them so that it communicates a story. I don't think anything communicates narrative as, as well as moldings do. And there's things you can do like this in a room like this. I hope you enjoyed the new house old soul, the molding edition, right? Well, one of the products I want to talk to you about is Sashco. Sashco is like the uh, Cadillac or the Lexus or <laughs> whatever great car you think it is. It's that car of the cock world, okay? And so the one you're maybe most familiar with is Big Stretch. And Big Stretch, and you think about it on jobs where we're putting in molding and millwork where sometimes paneled walls and paneled rooms, there's a lot of wood movement that goes along in those spaces. And having a good cock like Big Stretch is a big deal because once you go through a, a hot Texas summer, a cold winter, you know, there's a lot of wood movement that's going on as the wood settles into the house. And so Having a product like this means that we have less callbacks because it lasts a lot longer. It doesn't show up like the cheap cocks that just kind of crack and, and break apart. They've got an amazing product called Lexel, which is like a silicone type product. It's paintable. If you take a strip of Lexel versus a strip of silicone, if I pull a silicone, it snaps like this. If I do the same thing with Lexol, you'll see, look how that stretches out, right? And so it means it's more expandable. We use it on our 100 year window. We're setting the glass and these things. We know that it's not gonna get stiff over time. It's a much more expandable product and it's paintable. They also have, speaking of paintable, this exact color where you can actually take your cock, take your paint, mix it together. And you know, in some of those rooms, like we were looking at for this video, where you got the greens and the blues and those different colors, you know, having a paintable caulk like that, you know, saves a lot of time. So these guys have thought through all that stuff. They've got stuff for mortar, they got stuff for concrete. Sashco is an amazing company. I like being associated with them because they care about quality and they are really putting out a, a great product that makes us look better. So this is the kind of product that you're gonna really help you sell that new household soul, the quality, the level of execution, all those great things that go into this type of house. Yeah.